This is the What Matters Most podcast. A 100% listener-supported program. And now, here is your host, Paul Samuel Dolman. Welcome back to What Matters Most. I appreciate all the people around the world who listen, tune in, and write me emails and let me know what they think of the guests and also offer their ideas and their stories and their heart. Thank you. It's an honor to sit in the seat. And today I'm extremely excited because it's going to be a unique show and with a brilliant guest. And he is the CEO and founder of Direct Measures International. I'm going to let him share what that is. And it's an honor to welcome my new friend, Alon Stivy, to the show. Thanks for coming on, my friend. Uh, thank you for having me. On the human level, how have you done over the last two years with COVID? Uh, you know, uh, life is uh, full of unexpected uh, changes and uh, life is about change. So we've adapted, we've overcome, and we are okay. Has it affected the way you're moving through the world? Did you have to make a lot of changes? Yeah, to some extent, uh, like most people, a lot of the work that we do that relates with transfer of knowledge has moved online. But uh, I've done that before. I have an online university. I've been teaching people uh, important life-saving information. I've done that for the last 15 years. Will you talk about what you do and how you got started? I know you grew up in Israel, correct? I did, yeah. I was born in France, immigrated to Israel when I was a little boy. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, became a refugee of war in 1973 uh, during the Yom Kippur War and uh, started training in the martial art of Israel known as Hisadut, which means survival. It's a system that was developed to teach people how to survive threat of terrorism, became really good at it, uh, became an instructor, then joined the military, which is, as you know, mandatory in Israel. I joined Israeli Special Forces. I've seen some action, the war in Lebanon against terrorism. And I, I had the notion at the time, it's 1982-83, that terrorism uh, doesn't stop at the borders of Israel and that uh, those type of fanatics don't only target the Jewish people, but anyone who doesn't think like them, and in particular, um, Israel's uh, biggest ally and friend, the United States. So I thought it'd be a good idea, 1987, 1988, to go to America and teach Americans how to survive terrorism. And uh, that's what I've been doing since. Back then, a few people knew how to spell the word properly. <laughs> yeah, but I, I had the great fortune of uh, training and instructing the United States Navy SEAL uh, close quarter combat instructor. And through that, I made some uh, really good connection, training law enforcement first responder, started a company called Direct Measure. That's what it's all about, uh, providing this type of advanced tactical counterterrorism training, which branched out into providing security consulting and vulnerability analysis to businesses, Fortune 500 company, houses of worship. Uh, and then uh, our focus, one of our main focus became very clear in uh, after 1999 Columbine school massacre in Colorado. I had four children in a private school. I decided that I wanted to do whatever I could to make school in America safer against this type of uh, uh, violent threat. So I developed a program that's uh, called Terrorism Responder that was designed to train first responder uh, to intervene and respond in a more effective and a quicker manner to uh, terrorist and active shooter threat. I've taught uh, many, many uh, sheriff deputies and police officers across multiple states with the program, which was funded by, by the Department of Homeland Security. And while doing so, uh, Obviously, we had 9-11 happen, uh, which really may have brought into focus the type of work that I do. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first delivery of the terrorism responder course uh, that I had was scheduled for delivery on the day of 9-11 in Colorado. Yeah, yeah, it's how fate would have it. So obviously, we had to cancel the class that day. But uh, we, we picked it up a week later and, and occupancy doubled. And I've been uh, teaching that program since. But as I was doing so, came to the realization that that's not enough uh, because most casualty occur during this type of incident during the first 10 to 15 minutes 
uh, of a critical incident or uh, active shooter threat. So I decided to develop another program that was designed to teach what I term the on-location responder, the people at the site, you and I, school teacher, staff, faculty, hospital, uh, worker, uh, business, uh, places of worship, the people that are at the site of the attack and that are targeted uh, to teach them how to survive the first 10 to 15 minutes until help arrive, and also to teach them at the same time how to prevent those attacks from happening in the first place. So that program uh, is now, uh, has been taught to thousands of school staff, faculty, and, and hospital, and houses of worship across the nation. It's also delivered online in our, our online university program at the that we have, and uh, it is also the only program of its kind today that is uh, certified and funded by the Department of Homeland Security. It is listed on the National State and Federal Training Catalog, which means that the government uh, will pay for people to learn this in order to keep our society and community safer. So that's what I've been doing. I've also traveled the world um, and operated and provided security services, dignitary protection, executive security uh, to high worth individual and uh, business leader uh, in over 33 countries around the world. So I'm very familiar with how things are done in other places around the globe. And uh, in addition to that, in parallel to uh, doing that in the last five years, I've uh, decided to focus a little bit more and invest more time in integrating technology into what we, we are trying to do in making the world a safer place. Because one of the challenges of responding to any type of emergency is what we call the, in the military language, the fog of war. In other words, people don't know what is happening at the time. They don't know where the quote unquote bad guys are. They don't know where the people are hiding or taking shelter, where to go and, 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 and uh, point the rescuer and the first responder to. And obviously every decision made, uh, you know, quickly saves lives, right? Uh, and we've seen uh, information that came out a couple of years ago that says every uh, minute saved in uh, response time uh, when calling 911 will potentially save 10,000 lives per year in the United States alone, right? So time is of the essence. And uh, I decided to utilize modern technology uh, to diffuse, if you would, this fog of war to, to the extent it's possible. So I started a, a, a technology startup company called GoWare. Uh, you can find it at goit.global. And we've developed uh, an application and a software system that uh, allows the people on site to communicate in real time what is going on, where it's happening, uh, what are they seeing, what are they hearing. And then that information gets integrated with uh, IoT, which is uh, uh, Internet of Things, which is the, all, all the devices, the sensor that are on the site or say a school or a place of worship, so the camera, uh, the alarm system, even gunshot detection technology, all integrated into that platform. And all that information is delivered in real time to the first responder on their mobile device. And that saves a lot of time and improve response efficiency uh, quite a bit. Uh, as you probably know, the 911 emergency response system uh, was developed many years ago, about 65 years ago. And it was designed to uh, obviously call for help uh, for a single location and non-location based on a landline uh, to a single, typically a single crime uh, in progress, right? So a home invasion or, or a crime on the street uh, that someone can see from the window and or a bank robbery, something like that. And then our entire response, uh, emergency response system was built around that. Well, the 911 system is archaic when it comes to mass casualty critical incident, where there's a multitude 
of, of threats, uh, a very complex situation that's very dynamic, moving all the time, changing all the time. And in today's world, everyone has a digital device in their pocket that can provide text, can provide imagery, photograph, video in real time. Almost none of it is currently being considered and used by the 911 dispatch operator when during an emergency and, and, and very little of it gets into the hand of the first responder themselves in a timely manner so they can use it to save lives. This is what the, the, the fog of war that our system uh, is breaching. We've actually just land, uh, launched our website uh, about a week ago and people can go and learn about it. It's, uh, it's a program that I called One Community, and the website is onecommunity.world. And uh, that's what it's all about, right? Working together as one community to be safer, stronger, more resilient, and uh, have more fun and peace on Earth. So beautiful. And you're living literally on the edge between life and death and the work that you're doing and the way it affects people. And yet you have to stay completely calm, even though there's that life and death pressure. Otherwise, you're going to be in the fog of war. And you're not going to make good decisions. How do you, is it just training and the fact that you have so much experience that allows you to be supernaturally calm when so much is on the line? You know, that's an excellent question. And uh, the word you use, supernaturally calm, is not actually a, a thing that we think about because none of us are supernatural that way it's actually a natural ability that we all have to to basically compartmentalize the information uh, when we are in an emergency and leave the emotional side of it to a later date if you would and focus on what we have trained to do in order to a survive and b help other survive and keep everyone safe to the extent possible. You see, when, when you're in an emergency, you respond the way you were trained. It's just the way human brain works. So if you had no training, or you know, you even some people are in denial that there is such threat in this world, they don't even want to think about it. Well, denial is a form of ignorance because if something does happen, uh, you will simply, because you don't know what to do, freeze and, and, and do nothing. And, and, uh, and that's actually more dangerous than doing something. Right? So training is uh, the key factor in, in, in uh, responding to emergency in anything in life. It's, it's all about knowledge, right? But at the core of it all, and just kind of back, going back to your question of how I cope with it, I think it, the thing that the type of work that people like myself and, and many other do, whether it's covert or overt, uh, we do that because we're driven to do that. It, it's kind of like a, a calling. It, it's, 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 I, I even refer to it as like having a, a protector's instinct. It's something that you kind of like born with it. it. For me, it started at a young age where as a, as a young boy, it always bothered me all the time when there was some, what I perceived to be injustice done to anyone around me. I, I, I wouldn't stand for it. I would stand up and say something. I would even fight to protect some of my young friends that I thought were bullied, for example. And that kind of continued to dri drive my, I guess, evolution into understanding, okay, well, I got to know how to do that correctly and to, I know how to protect myself. So I've learned how to do that. And then I became really, really proficient at that to the point where I was able to teach others how to do that. So, so then I started spreading that knowledge to helping others how to teach them how to protect themselves. Then I went beyond that. I said, okay, well, it's not always going to be that there's someone there who knows what to do. What else can I do? And I've expanded from that to developing tools that I, some of them I just explained to you that will allow our community as a whole to protect itself and survive whatever may come. And, and survival is, is the story of our species, isn't it? I mean, I mean. And the jury's out whether we make it. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it certainly has been the story, the history of the Jewish people, and, and it always ended up working out. And there's two key factors to that, I believe, right? I mean, at the core of it all, I think in, from all my, you know, thinking and experience about this and in, 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 in interacting with people who do this, and I've, I've made it, you know, like my life focus to learn everything I can about survival and then to teach it. So I've talked to people from all walks of life who survive anything you can possibly imagine. I mean, it's a, it's a cancer survival, but war, terrorism, uh, natural disaster, being lost in the wilderness, uh, concentration camp. I mean, I've talked to them all. And I. it was very interesting because I ended up, if you would, uncovering on our understanding that all survivors shares common denominators in their characteristic that makes them survival, right? And yeah, those are the denominator that I teach that I find are equal to all human beings, no matter where you come from, no matter what gender, no matter what race, the color, what it doesn't matter, or age, you either have that or you don't. And the other aspect of it that I've learned is that it those characteristic can be cultivated as well. You know, muscle only gets stronger uh, against resistance, right, in the physical world. Well, willpower and the will to survive on that end, you know, gets stronger also against resistance. Now, obviously, you don't want to put yourself in dangerous situation just to get stronger, but the way you deal with adversity throughout life and the way you approach it and, uh, is what makes you from one adversity to the next better able the next adversity to be stronger and handle it better. But one of the core denominator that I found was common and still is, of course, is that the, the emotional component there comes down to basically one key emotion, and that's the management of fear. And before that, the understanding of what fear really is, right? Because we are now in, in an era of human evolution, I believe, that where fear is playing a key role in shaping you know, our history and our destiny. Right? Many people have become very accustomed in the last 10 years, I would say more than before, due to you know, the influx of information and, and, and media, right, uh, to, to consume fearful information and imagery so much so that they become almost addictive to it and and whether it has been brought upon everyone by design or just organically evolved uh you know it doesn't really matter why the fact of the matter is more people today particularly of concern to me is the younger generation, a big consumer of fear. And as such, we make decisions based on fear. In many instances, people that I work with uh, are, in an essence, victimized by fear because they're living uh, in what is a, I consider a low threshold of the flight or fight response all the time. Because if you have fearful thoughts and imagery in your mind, what if this and what if that's going to happen and you don't have any answer for it, you, you remain on constantly concerned about it, even if it's in your subconscious, even if it's in the back of your mind. And every decision you make related to your personal life, should I invest in my future? Should I go learn certain thing or not? Should I uh, get into a certain relationship or not? And many, many other decisions that we make every day are affected by this low level anxiety, if you would, not to mention your health, a lot of mental health issues have been increasing, you know, in the last few years, mostly due to the fear factor and what it does to our mind and body than anything else, right? And we just went to a, a period in our evolution as a species, global period of, of the pandemic, right, where it was driven by fear. We were made afraid of one another. We were locked down, kept away from one another. Who knows what the psychological long-lasting impact of that would be on uh, the developmental 
skill of young children that you know were locked at home for two years. But beyond that, it affected our economy. It affected the way we see the world, and it's all come down to that powerful emotion of fear. And that powerful emotion of fear is unfortunately being used for decades by terrorists and by people who have really what I consider to be no conscience just for their own benefit and greed and what have you, right? I mean, you have to realize that terrorism today is, is what it is because of media, right? The real weapon of terrorism is, is, is the main weapon is not bombs or guns or knives, it's fear. And, and like every weapon, uh, it, it has to have a delivery mechanism. You know, a bullet comes out of a barrel of a gun. Well, what, what, what does fear comes out of is what's the delivery mechanism for fear? It's the media, it's the mass media information age. So terrorism have been using that and anyone who is uh, an enemy of the free world has been using that to turn people against each other, to scare people from one another, and to basically to divide us and then potentially in one way or another later on conquer us, so divide and conquer. But if you think about it at its core, if more people will understand what is happening in their own heart and mind as a result of their exposure, overexposure to fear, they'll be able to regulate and, and uh, manage that in a much, much better way. Uh, I, I call this mental hygiene. I've, I've been teaching that for years. And it makes a huge difference on how you view the world, how you certainly how you respond to emergencies. And back to your question, how you feel and think if there is an emergency. You don't respond to it from a point of view of panic and fear. You respond to it from a point of view of knowledge and then also fate because there's only two real antidote to fear in our world right and i just mentioned both one is knowledge in other words you know what to do with something whatever you are envisioning it comes about then you actually go into action mode and you simply do what you prepared for and if you're faced with the unknown then what you fall back on is you are in a belief, your fate, whatever that may be, that your destiny is not to perish that day, your destiny is not to get hurt that day, that you will somehow uh, adapt and overcome and move on to the next thing and, and continue to survive and, and strive. And, and Israel as a country has been based on that. The mindset of its people is came from that. If I want to remind you, the Jews were in the concentration camp, annihilated, uh, less than 80 years ago, and now they have a, a, you know, a striving, successful country and community with its own problem, obviously, it's a democracy, it's a free society, but what a big difference in such a short time, uh, you know, considering what is, where they came from and where they're going. And that's accredited in, in very much so me living there for over 20 years, I can tell you that for a fact, it's accredited to the way that they manage fear and the way they perceive the world and their fate, that there is uh, order, that there is uh, uh, a force, there is God, there is an intelligent design and everything is leading what's happening in our world at all time, right? So knowledge, and fate will help anyone combat fear in any situation. And then obviously working together as a community, realizing what it is that we are facing together, it makes it even uh, better and more efficient and faster. Because, you know, there's a lot of people who sometimes think about, oh, well, what if there is World War Three? Lots of talk about it nowadays, right? Well, Right, uh, and, and I'm gonna prep. There's a whole community of prepper in America, but estimated to be 25% of American are preppers. Preppers are people that pre prepare for a doomsday scenario, right? Whatever the food, weapon, ammunition, shelter, whatever. And a lot of them have this mindset always, if something happened, I'm gonna run for the hills and I will survive with my family and my pets. I think that's a flawed thinking because 
we can't do that on our own. What, what, what's the point of surviving by yourself on top of a mountain all alone? You, we need to think about this as a community and it's about community resiliency. So getting together with your, your neighbor, with your friends, with your family, with your loved one, with your, the member of your church or synagogue or, or the uh, other parents in your school, coordinating, talking about it and uh, is a way better way to go than, uh, you know, this uh, solo survivalist separatist mindset. Uh, after all, this country was founded of on those principles of community, right? And family and community coming together. And, and, and that's what's called the United States of America. So our, our unity is what, you know, has made us strong all this year and will continue to do so. And it's an example for the rest of the world. And, and as I mentioned a little earlier, there are forces out there who would like to break that unity. And, and if they can't do it by force, they'll do it to uh, deception and disinformation and misinformation, uh, which is easy to do today, easier than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. So we have to be cognizant of that tactical strategy, if you would, of the use of fear against us to weaken us from within. Wow, that was the greatest dissertation because <laughs> you really hit the core thing, I feel like as a single human being and as a society, we are presented with fear. And I don't mean primal caution, like move out of the water when you see the shark fin or move away from the tank or get off the railroad tracks, the trains come into the houses on fire, grab the dogs and run. So much of it now is manufactured in our head and we become addicted to it. It's in movies, it's on our screens, it's in our pocket. And I see powerful forces working hard to keep us afraid because that's the easiest way to control people with primal fear through the cortex. And that our singular thing here as a human being is to overcome that and to thrive and strive and ascend and then be a beautiful human being in this mosaic with each other as a community, not as a lone wolf out there with our bombs and our booby traps. And then to be a force of light like you're trying to do in the world and so many others are. And that's our core thing. Do we know who we are? And if something happens, we'll trust that we can handle it and we learn to. So that way it's not just a misbelief, a delusion. But in the meantime, we live fearlessly in the world. We turn off the propaganda, which comes from us from everywhere, whether it's we need to buy something we don't need, go into debt or be manipulated or you know, not talk to the neighbor because they have a different political view or a sign in their yard and, and lose their humanity. This is it. This is the whole thing here. And then if you can do that, by the way, if we had 300 million people in the world who in this country who fought like you, the entire system would be completely different. You couldn't have the political system, the economical system, the inequality, the injustice, because 300 conscious, 300 million conscious citizens would not stand for it. It would never even get that far. You wouldn't be able to do this. Absolutely. There is more people thinking like that around the world today than there were two, two and a half years ago. And that's one of the positive things, actually, that came out of this COVID pandemic. It kind of gave us an example as a humanity for the first time, I think, ever, or maybe in a very long time, that we are all in this together. And that together is the only way to fight and survive because no one is immune. And by collaborating and coordinating our effort and believing in what we just discussed, we can make our lives better across the board. And, and that's a message that's now resonating, I believe, with the, with the conflict in the Ukraine, for example. I, what I mean by that is I don't think that if this conflict in the Ukraine, this war and atrocity uh, would have occurred before COVID, I don't think you would have had this level of engagement, support uh, from the world over to support the freedom of the Ukrainian people and to stop the Russian invasion as you have now. But because of COVID, because we've all gotten together and understood this fundamental, we are now able to, uh, again, come together real quickly, as a matter of fact, and do whatever is possible to try to de-escalate the situation and stop the atrocity. So e evolution teaches us things. And that's where in my mind personally, right, is where intelligent design and, and the, the will of God comes into play, right? Because you don't have to look only at what is happening, but you have to look beyond that at what order 
how that thing is happening around the world, on an individual level, on a country level, and how all of those things are interconnected to actually help us get to where we need to be. And there is a force because all life, whether you look at a hummingbird or inside of us or anything, it's the intelligence, the ecology, the galaxy, the cosmos, the fact that we're communicating in real time and what our brains are capable of, which is just a fraction of what we use. It's so miraculous that it can't be just some arbitrary thing. And also the more I have leaned into the mystical while being grounded in the real, it's interactive, which is mind blowing to me when I was young, I thought as a one singular aspect in organism, why would the benevolent infinite care about me? I'd somehow, I'm not saying it favors me, but it, I interact with it, it guides me and I live more beautifully and in the flow here, I have tremendous synchronicity and anyone can do it, it's democratic. If you open the door to it, they open the door to your heart to it. And I'm not talking about religion. That's the other end of the extreme. That's a mind-based didactic system that's imposed. That's someone else's experience in a book. I'm talking about a cutting edge being alive. It doesn't even have to have any mystical. Just look around and be open. And, and what's interesting is I, I can already feel that in you, or at least I'm projecting it. Yes, spirituality is what you're speaking of. There is another dimension to human being that's beyond the physical and the psychological and the biological. And that is that the spirituality. And we all share that across the board equally. And you were saying we got to open ourselves to it. Before that, what I'm saying right now is not only we got to open ourselves to it, but we've got to clear up the window. The window is fogged by misinformation and fear. Take a cleaning rug, wipe it clear, and look out at the sunlight. Then you'll be able to see much beyond the horizon. And you'll see that we're actually all looking at the same sun and the same sunrise and sundown. This is the fate of humanity, and this is where we are going. And it's more today prevalent and evident than I think ever before because of this global catastrophic event that are happening or have happened in the last three, four years. People are feeling more united, although they won't speak about it like you and I right now. But if you catch them in person, and I've spoken to many people all over the world, like I mentioned, it's the same vibe. And we got to cultivate that. And those vibes, when joined together, as you say, synergetically, are going to bring about what Perhaps in the old days, we were called miracles, right? right. It's, it's happenings of, of, uh, because all those energies are converging into a focal point of doing things together for the betterment of our existence, our world, and our community and lives. So this is a transformational moment. I agree. I've had the president of Mexico on, Vicente Fox, talking like this, billionaires who are trying to find equality, people that are working with the peasants in the fields of India, Dr. Shiva, to try to grow seeds and deal with Monsanto. Uh, I've had people from Israel all over the world. And there is a consciousness arising that is begging to be born. If like you say, both we have to open, but we have to proactively break free from our chrysalis like a, a caterpillar. And, and it's a clumsy metaphor and become the butterfly right? And not just crawl around the ground and be a bunch of scavengers. In the meantime, we have to take care of business, tie up the camels, the oldest biblical line, but take care of business. But there's something more beautiful trying to come forth and maybe it will anyway. I don't know. I, I don't believe in a Disney movie thing where you always get the happy ending. I feel better if we all created the happy ending and that's going to be a lifetime, a many lifetime process. And it's going to take teachers like you, consciousness, shows like this, and anyone listening to just wherever they are, become more awakened, more enlightened, more connected, more in love, not fear. And then to take that into the grocery line, wherever they are, the schoolroom, into their own families and into their own lives in a million ways. And I feel like all of that collectively, the hundred monkey theory, we could make a leap where tyrants like Putin or whoever uh, we won't have that anymore. The world just won't tolerate it. We won't do that. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's, it's not we could make a leap. We are 
making a leap. It is happening. It, it really is. But you mentioned something very uh, fundamental here. Uh, we spoke of the uh, what is the antidote to fear, right? And I mentioned in my belief, it's faith and knowledge. But let me ask you this question. What do you think the opposite of fear is? Yeah, love is the opposite. It's love. A hundred percent. And and it's a polarity, isn't the whole thing, Alon, just a giant polarity, like the same way you look at a uh, an atom? And the polarity creates a magnet, which creates the energy, which creates the third dimensional reality that we have. Right. And that polarity swings. So finding finding that balance in the center and the, 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 the power or the force, if you would, that harmonizes it all, it always comes up to the same thing, love. And love is universal, just like fear is universal. But love is where the shifting of the spirit and the mind has to go toward. And, and I think it's happening much more than it used to now. And because of that, we're going to see things that are going to materialize and manifest in this world that we weren't seeing prior and not on the scale and not at the, at the speed that it's, it is materializing, right? This is a wonderful, amazing time. Although to people who are driven by fear, you would look at it and go, wow, this is very dangerous time. What is going on here, right? But it's, it's, it's the lens that you put on. Is, is your sunglasses dark or are they pink or are they transparent? <laughs> I like to use straightforward, transparent glasses because the world is colors is as beautiful as it ever anything can get i don't need to color it with anything else and i like to look at the world and reality as it is and as i'm making my profession to know how people think and behave for safety reason but also in order to genuinely interact with others our reality is the one that we create and we are when we work together, following the understanding that love is the driving force, we will create the reality we all want to be in. So it's not a Disney movie. I think in this case, art imitates life. Alan, don't we get the reality in which we see the world and project out into the world? I am a believer. I'm a believer in the miracles. I believe everybody's basically good. I believe in synchronicity. I trust people inherently unless I get a really weird feeling. And for this is the reality in which I move through the world. Everything works out. And if something doesn't, I was not supposed to have it. It's still good. I can't believe I have running water and food to eat. I'm one of the lucky ones. I have friends. I have love. I'll never stop learning. I'm, I don't really know anything, but I'm curious. So I'm constantly learning. I couldn't wait to talk to you today. I had no idea what it would be, but I'm excited about what's next. And I have a fundamental optimism that it'll be good. And then if it's not, I grieve, but then the next day is a new day and it will pass. It is good because ultimately in life, we either win or we learn. And, and, and even when, when, when people consider, oh, this was a hard lesson. Yes, but by learning it, you're already winning. So we either win or learn. As long as we are in that mode, we are evolving. And the key now is that because of technology, remember we spoke of technology as the, uh, the tool uh, the mechanism that delivers fear. But that same tool, it's what we, we consider a double-edged sword. You can use it either way you like, depending on the intelligence behind it. That same magnificent tool can spread exactly what we spoke about right now. This message of collaboration, love, and uh, togetherness that will take us and move us forward and progress. And that's why I do the show. That's the core thing right there. And I want to give people a voice by the way, I always win because to me, winning is having the experience and just showing up and being present and how lucky to have the experience that the whole world isn't just vanilla, boring. It'll never be perfect. You would hang yourself. You'd be so bored. And then it's just whatever experience I've had, the rain is beautiful and it creates the contrast so I can enjoy the sunny day. And then everything just becomes the buffet. What's on the buffet today and how much control do I have? If I have no control over to change the buffet, I eat whatever they put out or I fast because maybe I'm, I could lose two pounds. Well, thank you for being a so curious and so open and for presenting and, and creating this platform to show the prism of humanity and what's, what's out there and that knowledge that needs to be shared among all. Are you afraid of your own death or do you, I know both of us love being alive, but I, while I don't want to suffer, I don't fear my mortality. If anything, it makes everything so valuable. 
even if it's in its simplicity, I'm not, I realize I came from somewhere mysterious and I will return. So I don't fear that because in, in essence, I trust what we would call God or the Supreme force. Yeah, it's a great question for someone with my background, of course, as you can imagine, I have faced that question very intimately multiple times. And I've, I've also had, you know, very, very good people uh, lose their life, uh, you know, a little prematurely. And uh, also had, you know, very negative, full of fear and anger people lose their life. So the others don't. And uh, I think the answer to this question for me is no, because what is what is uh, fear of that is another uh, mind game, right? Where does fear exist? What is the nature of fear? Fear, not, again, we're not talking about that uh, responsive, you know, uh, reaction to an emergency that suddenly appear and you have to do something to survive and you're startled. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the preoccupation with fearful thought and, and anxiety and this kind of things. Where does it exist? It exists in the mind. Fear, by definition, is an anticipatory emotion. We create it in our own mind. We make it what it is, as big or as small as we want to make it. So when someone says, well, I'm afraid of that, how can you be afraid of something that you don't even know what that means or is? So you're just afraid of what you are imagining, quote unquote, that to be. Well, you could imagine anything you want. Some people imagine it in one way. Some people imagine it the other way. We are in control. Now, obviously, there's out there people in, in, in power play who'd like to tell you, hey, I, if you do what I tell you, oh, your debt will be different than others. I will, I will give you a debt, an outlook of, of, of life and debt that, that will put you at peace today. But they don't know because they haven't died and come back. As, you know. <laughs> so, so it's all one, one giant fear-mongering game. If you don't play the fear mongering and sharing game, it does not have the effect on you that it has on other people. I don't preoccupy my mind with that. Whether I will transition to something else or not, how it will occur, when it will occur, all of that is unknown to me. I'm not gonna preoccupy my mind to that. I'm gonna preoccupy my mind with what I can do today, tomorrow to make the world a better place. That's the way to live. And I have done countless shows with people who have had that near-death experience. You've never seen anyone more peaceful. And most of them were really depressed when they came back at first because it was so amazing. And my own father, who died over a period of a week or two, he chose to leave. He was uh, basically an atheist his whole life. But he had this, he was very, very conscious. He became supremely conscious. And he could see both sides. And he saw guys that had been killed in World War II with him. And he, he said it's the most beautiful experience, but he wasn't going to rush towards it. He was just going to allow it. And he left with a smile on his face, and I was there. And to me, it's just, when is my time? I surrender, and I will be, I don't understand what it'll be. No one can, but I believe it will be as beautiful as my father experienced it. And by the way, his mother got on a wagon around 1903 and fled the Ukraine in Odessa from a pogrom. And came across Europe with her relatives over a couple of years, came to this America through Ellis Island in Brooklyn, like my grandfather did from other countries, his family. And you talk about survival, that's, and, and the love of life, you know, it's, uh, do you ever get over being a refugee because your early years with that war in 1973, isn't that just, it seems like it's always ingrained in the initial imprinting of the way one would move through the world. Well, it sure did, right? I believe it was part of what made me what I am today and, and what I do for a living. Uh, as, as, a young, as a young boy, I realized that day that anything can change at any time. But instead of succumbing to uh, a terrorizing, fearful way of living and thinking, I decided, no, but, but it's not necessarily it has to be so. There is thing that can be done. We can do on an individual level and now on a collective level that will determine our destiny more than anything else. And that's why I do what I do. But did it impact me? Of course, everything we go through impacts us. But you you were mentioning and we agreed, right? There is a physical, there is the psychological, and then there is spiritual aspect of a human being. Well, if, if one knows and understand the spiritual uh, part of us, by definition, you're saying there's something else in our existence 
that is not connected to the physical world, which means by definition, it will continue to exist as existed before and it has no physical limitation. So by definition, it also integrate and mingle with all other such spiritual uh, entities and realms. So, so is this the only world and existence in place? 100% no which means is, is life physically and death physically, the beginning and end? Absolutely not either. Well, you nailed it. If I put you in charge of peace in the Middle East, would it even be possible? You seem like somebody who could probably work out almost anything under reasonable circumstances. What if the Intergalactic Council chooses me as Supreme Leader and says, figure out Middle East peace? And I said, I got to make a call to my friend Alon. How would... <laughs> Is there any hope there, or is it just so tribal in thousands of years that you killed, I did, this shouldn't exist, that? Um, I'm always hopeful. I almost feel like if we could get everybody in a room, we could figure it out. You, 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 I agree with you. And, you know, I, first of all, I'll be honored. Number two, I'll be humble because it's a, a major task. And I will tell you right off the bat, uh, we have to work as a team because it's going to take it's going to take a village. But but. <laughs> But, 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 but absolutely, I can tell you from living there, and, and what I mentioned to you, I, I was a refugee of war in 1973. That was because I lived in the Sinai Desert, which was part of Israel after the Six-Day War. And, and we lived in an outpost, eight-hour drive away, nine-hour drive away from the center of Israel. 50 families, a place called Abu Odes, only 50 families and a few soldiers guarding us. And on my birthday, October 6, 1973, was my birthday was when we were attacked first thing in the morning right right so, so you talk about an experience that shaped someone's life but why am i telling you that because when i was going out there my some of my best friends were bedouins nomad tribes that live in the desert the camel the sheep the herd uh, so i grew up understanding there is no difference and i can tell you as growing up in israel interacting with with uh, people on all sides at the core of it all Everyone wants to have a good life, a happy life, a healthy life, a, a chance for education and success. I don't care what religion you come from, which country you come from, it's all one common denominator. If you take a, a Palestinian mother and an Israeli mother and an Egyptian mother and a Jordanian and a Saudi, you put them in privately in a conversation, you ask them the same question, they all give you the exact same answer I told you now. What, what mingles and messes things up is the interest that other different powers and forces out there have to make people feel full of one another. Now there's fundamental we have to agree on, human safety, peace, survival, continuity, support, but the Middle East is more ready for it today than it's ever been. There's been already historical changes and peace accord, as you know, between Israel and what was considered when I was there, the, the, the absolute enemy of Israel. Now there is peace. So that has happened not because some people suddenly changed their core belief, but more so because people realize war and bloodshed and suffering is not the future. The future is uh, success, collaborating business and growing together. And I think the more people are exposed to that reality, to what is actually happening, the more people are going to realize, hey, it is time for peace. Because you know? fear and terrorism is funded, right? But let's not forget the big business, quote unquote. It's funded by rogue regime like Iran and other forces that are trying to manipulate things behind the scene to give them a raison d'être, a, a, a reason to exist, right? Because otherwise, why does a, a, a dictatorship regime e even exist, right? Unless they can point outside to another country and say, oh, we're here to protect you from the enemy. Yeah, it's fear again. It's fear. So more people understand that fear uh, can be dissipated, that together we can resolve anything, uh, the better it will be. And it's coming to the Middle East, I think, very soon. Wow. Amen. And by the way, I've been all over the world, probably not as much as you, but talk to people, Iranian, Israeli, Palestinian, Russian. Everybody just wants to have a good life, be peaceful and raise their kids and have plenty to eat no matter what the governments do usually they're they're as you know terrorized by their own government as anybody what you say for some reason power attracts sociopaths because the good people would rather not be bothered they'd rather go garden and play baseball with their kids or 
have a picnic on the beach. It's the nutcases that want to run the world. And fear is what keeps a Putin in power. And I look at Saudi Arabia, they're the big funder of a lot of terrorism. They funded 9-11. I mean, they're facts and stuff like that. But because of oil dollars, uh, I know I got to let you go. We're, we're running out of time. But uh, so what I, I almost feel like I know the answer just based on you, who you are in this. I can feel it. You, you do believe that humanity, humanity itself will survive its darkest impulses and that we won't go the way of the mammoth and the dinosaurs and then basically return to Earth to God and all the creatures in peace. You think we will, there is some version of us that will stick around? Oh, we'll do more than stick around. We will spread across the stars. Oh, wow. This is our future. This is our destiny. This is what we were created for. We are not dinosaurs. <laughs> So, and, and anybody who doesn't see it and who chooses to use force and fear, it's to their demise and it's unfortunate, but they too, maybe some of them anyway, one day will change and understand. You know, they do that because they cannot, you're saying people in power are sociopaths, so they, so they use fear to manipulate things around it. You know why? Because they can't use love in order to get things what they wanted. So they're using force and fear. It just got to change the recording reprogram and that's to education to information and to eliminate ignorance ignorance has no place in the age of information but we have to be careful not to be misinformed are people flat out shocked when they hire uh, an idf agent for formerly a security guy and trying to keep the world safe and away from terrorism and uh, it, they end up with basically a cool mixture of gandhi and and also a, ra a modern rabbi, a spiritualist, a little, you know, mystical Jesus. It's like it was a Jew. I mean, I mean, I love it. I mean, it's, uh, that's the greatest thing about what I do. If you just come with an open heart, you never know who you're going to develop. And 99% of the time, there's this beautiful humanity that transcends the role or where they came from or the title. If you're just willing to invite it to come forth. Are you, can you move through the world in your corridors like this, or do you have to become security guy and play the role and not be able to like, cause I can't, under, I couldn't see how all this beautiful spirituality and philosophy wouldn't permeate every interaction that you have. It, it does. And, and that's the interesting part of the body, right? It's been a, a, a gradual change in, in me, obviously, and in my relationship with, with those that I work for, those that I work with. But I have not faced any resistance or any pushback. I think everybody's getting it. And remember what I do, we have to be careful in, in, in doing security and safety. Careful, right? They know I'm full of care. And therefore, I will be careful for their safety and security. And that's what we have to do for one another. Is there a place where you can turn it all off? Do you get out in nature or do you go out on a boat? I imagine if you go into a restaurant, you sit with your back to the door, you know, that, I mean, I mean, you're back to the wall. And I, I mean, I do that. And I'm not even a security expert. I mean, I, it would be impossible not to be you and suss out every situation. But is there a, a place, do you meditate or do you get out in the redwoods? What do you do to just put aside the shield, take off the armor and be... It totally a piece and at one with the beauty that you are. You, you know, I, I do take time, of course, and nature is the best gym in the world uh, to, to absorb, you know, creation and become part of it. So I do meditate. I do all kinds of exercises all my life. Uh, you know, I'm the master of the martial arts. So I've been doing it for 50 years. There's different aspects to the martial art that are not kinetic. And, and violent in nature, but uh, actually healing and cultivating. I do that. I, I interact with beautiful, lovely people. And, you know, I, I, I'm doing what I am. And when you do what you are, it's not a burden. It's not heavy. I, I, I expand my shield to everyone I'm around with. And part of that is me teaching and discussing some of those spiritual concepts that we just talked about. Because people need that kind of shielding for themselves. These are tools. Uh, in closing, we have listeners all around the world, and God only knows who's listening to this. I'm so glad you are. I get notes from all over. It's shocking and surprising. How does that person who would like to move into this mindset, in this way of being through the world, I know there's not one way, there's infinite ways, but you are a great guide, you are a teacher, and you have pointers. Uh, what would you say to them to help them imbue this, embody it, and then 
get involved in it because it could be the first time they've ever heard about it or they knew it was inside of them. They just never heard it talked about. Today, they found us. How do they take the next step? What would you say to them if they just ended up with you in a cafe or they hired you and they said, Alon, tell me, how do I, how do I move into this way of living and being? Well, if you're asking me how to come in contact with me and the help that I provide and the work that I do, then I have a multitude of websites and people can find me online by name. But the main security company website is directmeasures.com. Uh, the online learning is accert.com, attack countermeasure training certification, accert.com. And then the community technology that we have developed and we are embracing. And as a team, we are bringing to the world that, that that's the tool that can be found at one community dot world and that's literally brand new two weeks ago we launched the website we've been developing the technology for two years but we just launched the website two weeks ago i'm accessible on, on social media as well and i'm here to be who i am and that is help as many people as possible that are good natured and well-meaning to live safe and secure and better their existence in this world for all our sake. And we have links to that web, your primary website. How do they walk out the door right now though and put leave fear behind and walk out the door and walk into life without so much fear and more love in their heart? You know, first of all, they got to sit down with themselves and really feel and think in a quiet place totally who they are, what they're coming from, regardless of the suffering and the pain that they've had and the experiences that they've had and put that aside for just a few moments and think what it is that they are, what it is that truly really gets them going. Why are they angry if they are, or why are they fearful? Is it because they don't have enough love? Is it because they don't have enough connection? with people who they love or want to have connection, but they're frustrated. It could be a multitude of things, but it always centrally come back to this core thing. And once they realize that, don't give up on that vision, stay focused, don't get distracted by this, by this noise. So tune down the noise. When you look at something on TV or online or, or, or you hear something on the radio, make it judgment, is this necessary? For me, is this useful for me? Is it positive for me? And is it uh, timely for me? And you got these four fundamental that will allow you to start screening what you're consuming. I mean, we watch what we eat. We have a, a fitness craze in the country. Uh, everybody's on a, one sort of, of a diet or another on the physical side of the nutrition. But this is that we're consuming to our minds without any regards to our health as also needs to be regulated and no one can do it for us because if someone does it for us, then it's not freedom and then it's censorship. And then they are putting in our head whatever they want. No, we have to learn to do it for ourselves. I think that that mental hygiene should be taught in every school from a young age. I think it should be made quote unquote cool for kids to be able to do that for themselves and others. You've been listening to the What Matters Most podcast, a 100% listener-supported program. If you feel inspired, please go to our Patreon page at www.patreon.com backslash whatmattersmost and join our family. So until the next time, stay inspired and in the light.